thoughts you get are so much more and really invaluable. You get to meet so many people. You get a fantastic look behind the scenes, how things are organized, how are they working. And in the end, you have so much fun with your group that at one point I actually decided to quit my regular job that I had and go for the sports events mainly and start a career there. That was Elke, volunteer turned head of volunteers and workforce for the upcoming Special Olympics World Games. After volunteering at the FIFA World Cup in Germany and having a once in a lifetime experience managing the VVIPs in her hometown of Hamburg, Elke decided to start a new career in the sports and events industry, following some of the biggest events around the world to manage their volunteers. In this podcast, Elke shares her insights into her time spent managing volunteers in the Middle East and how patience and an understanding of different cultures only enhances your volunteer management program. Elke also chats through her planning process ahead of the Special Olympics World Games and shares her insights into the best ways to engage your volunteers, including the important role that technology should play to ensure a streamlined process from start to finish. This podcast was recorded remotely, so we do apologize for the broken audio at times. Here's hoping that these podcasts can be recorded in person sooner rather than later. Thank you so much for joining us on the Engage Volunteer Podcast. You've had such an incredible journey over a long period of time, and I would love to almost start at the start as to how you got into managing volunteers and, and a bit of why you're still doing it. Yes. Hi, Shannon. First of all, thank you for having me and no uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about my journey. It all started in 2006 uh, when yep. I myself started out as a volunteer for the FIFA World Cup in Germany. Awesome. Yeah, okay. It was in Hamburg, my hometown. Hamburg. Fantastic. And since I had a little bit of background uh, with uh, having to do with diplomats, I, I got a for my, uh, from my perspective, really ideal job because I was uh, positioned in the in the protocol uh, department and was in charge of the seat allocation in the VIP and VVIP grants. Wow. Then. Okay. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> that was really <laughs> well, yeah. and I I enjoyed it so much uh, working with all these people. Of course, um, being able to see the matches and so on. But that whole atmosphere really attracted me so much that right after the, the uh, World Cup was over, I started looking uh, for a new possibility where to, to volunteer next. And then came a handball world championship and then uh, came the IAAF uh, world championships in Berlin or oh, in between yeah. there was the UEFA Euro in Vienna. And I always took um, all my annual leave, invested money to to travel there and so on, uh, everything that it entails to be a volunteer. But wow, the, re awesome. the rewards you get are so much more and really invaluable. You get to meet so many people. You get a fantastic look behind the scenes, how things are organized, how are they working. And in the end, you have so much fun with your group that at one point I actually decided to quit my regular job that I had and go for the sports events mainly and start a career there. And I was already relatively old at that time. Yeah, well, no, you, you've, you've had quite the journey, haven't you? And, and being in Europe, you have such exposure to so many tournaments and championships and World Cups that come to Europe. Like you've been able to be involved with quite a few and, and through that learnt and dealt with lots of different people from all walks of life. Maybe just touch on that for us, if you can, about what you've learned about dealing with people from all across the world, really, in, in what your role is. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, um, I really, meanwhile, dealt with people from all corners of the world, whether it was volunteers or whether it was supervisors or colleagues. Um, the, the job before this one in Berlin now was um, in Abu Dhabi, which is like sure. a totally different culture, but it was so exciting. And I loved the three and a half years that I was there. And it's, I'm, I'm always interested in, in the rest of the world because the world is so colorful with all its cultures, all its of people, course. all the different characters, the different ways of working. Um, and I'm, kind of soaking all this up and I, I really enjoyed. What I definitely yeah. learned is 
patience, especially in sure. the last job. You can never force people to do something. You have to be patient. And that was quite a challenge for me to learn that. But uh, I think I'm, I'm pretty good at that now. Yeah, very, very interesting and good point. Uh, the, and the Middle East is a growing part of the world for events. And I know Saudi's doing a lot at the yeah. moment trying to attract events. Um, yeah. Is there any particular, obviously patience is key over there working in the Middle East, but any other uh, key advice for people getting work over in the Middle East and, and how to work best with the culture? I would say go with the flow um, and in the end, everything will turn out well. Yeah. Even if you, you are about to lose your mind and think everything will collapse and never work out, in the end it will. Because <laughs> if push comes to shove and time is really getting tight, my experience is that somehow some pockets open up, money is pouring out and things are getting done. Sure. Okay. So things will get done in the end. Uh, we'll have our good friend Cormac Rabel onto the podcast in a few episodes time to talk about his experience in the Saudi desert for the Anthony Joshua fight. Uh, okay. It blew my mind listening to uh, the way that it worked, but you're right. It, it all yeah. turned out in, in the end. And I think your experience has yeah. been the same there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, also the, the culture of, of uh, volunteer, or the, the volunteer culture in that area, or maybe just in the Emirates, I'm, I'm not really sure, is a very special one since um, students have to volunteer a certain number of hours per year and that for me was like a total contradiction um, either mm -hmm. you volunteer or you have to do something <laughs> uh, but there it worked out I mean it, it started with me getting used to the question um, how many hours do I get for this that was always the first one that the, the uh, volunteers asked how many hours sure. do you credit me for that which in the end, you just do a rough number and put it in. I mean, yeah, sure. it's of no harm to us giving them a few extra hours. If it makes them happy, that's it. Then what I also um, notice is that they love to do their jobs in pairs, <clears throat> i.e. two girls or two boys being in one position, although you only scheduled one for it. Sure. That's just yeah. the way they work there. And yeah. it was for me, it was also very interesting that um, in the beginning they were kind of shy and not sure and not really motivated to be there. But once they found out that they could meet the other gender there without any supervision <laughs> from their family or friends or whatever, they just loved it. Sure. So the, uh, the strange benefits that come out of volunteering uh, <laughs> are wide was, and varied. Absolutely. It was really interesting to see. And there were people who just did it for the hours, so to speak. And then you have these other volunteers. I had one guy there from India who worked night shifts in, I don't know what kind of production area or in a supermarket or whatever. And from his job, he came directly to the competition in order to help out during the day for Special Olympics. Wow. Um, I don't know when that guy started. Yeah, it was, it was really amazing. Really, really amazing. Others came from other Emirates and traveled like three hours just to get there for their shift and then traveled three hours back and were there again the next day. It was really amazing. <laughs> I've heard uh, some crazy stories. One of a, a volunteer that turned up in his gold-plated Lamborghini to volunteer. Yeah. part of the yeah. car just next you, to his shift. And you just get used and, to those cars. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> Especially the, the girls who they are allowed to drive in the Emirates. That's not a question, but yeah. um, some of them, well, either they drove up in their Porsches or in their Maseratis. I've seen that myself. Uh, or they are being brought by their driver, which is yeah. really common there, that the girls do have a driver with cars. So they are being brought to their volunteer work and are being picked up after their shift. <laughs> it was, you just have to get used to it and accept yeah, it. Yeah, totally. Very different to but the rest of the world for volunteering culture, but that's a, <laughs> a, it's a beautiful yeah. part of the world. And uh, you, as you said, the different colors that the world has, uh, yeah. I think you've, you've had a great experience being able to see all of that and be involved. So uh, I guess from there, you're back in the home country, but in Berlin this time. Talk to me a bit about your, your upcoming role. It will basically 
be more or less the same like in Abu Dhabi, I, I will be or I am since Monday the volunteer and workforce manager for the Special Olympics World Games, which World will take Games. place in 2023 yeah. here in Berlin. This also entails the, uh, the same work for the National Games, which will take place one year earlier in 2022. We're preparing for that as well. Yeah, fantastic. And so the, the World Games, correct me if I'm wrong, but that is that a, every four years it happens similar to an Olympic Games and, and it's all countries coming together. Can you provide some context to the event? Yeah, it is uh, held in the same um, circle like the, the Olympic Games, i.e. we have Winter Games and we have Summer Games. The Summer Games were last year, so they will take place in 2023, as I mentioned. And the Winter Games are taking place like always in between in a, with a two years difference, mm -hmm. like in 2021 and then in 2025 again. Yeah, okay, very good. And so you're very early in your role, but can you yeah. talk to me a bit about what the journey will look like? You think you obviously need to recruit a team around you? Um, uh, over the coming years and months into the games and how many volunteers yeah. you're looking for and so on? Yeah, the, the team is just being formed at the moment, so to yeah. speak, with all the challenges we are facing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Like, for instance, I have a, um, a senior manager who is my direct supervisor. He is stuck in India at the moment. Um, sure. No idea when he will be able to come to Berlin. But wow. thanks to all these technical gadgets these days we are on on video video conference and, and facetime every day and, and are talking about certain things well uh, to give you some numbers we are planning uh, with or to have about twenty thousand volunteers for the world games and about yeah. three three and a half thousand for the national games the year before and yeah. those volunteers will certainly be um, the core group for the World Games later on, because then they have already gone through a set of games here in Berlin. We expect about 7,500 athletes from 170 countries. And yeah. what else can I tell you? <laughs> and multiple venues around uh, Berlin yeah, as well. Yeah, multiple and, venues. The, the that is right. um, correct. Uh, the, the majority of competitions will take place in the exhibition halls, the, the Messe Berlin, and in the uh, around uh, area around the uh, Olympic Stadium. But we will also have uh, competitions in, in the city, like in front of the Brandenburg Gate, there are some competitions which will take place. There are other things taking place on Alexanderplatz, the Platz, which is one of the yep. main squares here, very famous. And then, of course, the competitions involving water, whether it's sailing or <laughs> open water swimming or what have you, will be in on one of the lakes uh, yeah. where we have multiple here in and around Berlin. Yeah, fantastic. So you've got quite the lead in now to, to build quite a... Quite a large program, um, lots yeah. of volunteers and, and a big team, no doubt, that will support you with that. So I guess you've had such incredible experience to date. Um, for those people that you'll no doubt uh, have working for you in your team, uh, have you got any advice for, for volunteer managers about really the best way to engage with volunteers? Because uh, I guess for your program, uh, I'm guessing but probably 12 months or so recruitment period in terms of from when you're launching to event time, like uh, there's a long period of time for, for these major events in which engagement yeah. is pretty critical. That, that is right. And there are basically two major golden rules that I would give as advice to upcoming volunteer managers. One mm -hmm. is communication is the key. Always keep volunteers in the loop of what is going on. And if it starts with an automatic um, re response, thank you for your registration. That yep. is already the first step on a long journey. And appreciate the, the effort uh, those volunteers are making. Because without volunteers, no big um, event, whether it's sports event or other events, no event could take place. Um, a lot of people always tend to 
overlook those volunteers, really not see yep. them. If they weren't there, those things couldn't take place. Whether it's somebody handling the cables or somebody just checking your uh, accreditation or even printing the accreditations, that is all done by volunteers. And if that stuff doesn't happen, all the, the, the medals could not be distributed. Right. And this whole yeah. the tablets with those medals, these are yep. all volunteers. And yeah. I think we can really not appreciate enough all the, the time they are investing, all the money they are investing, because in most of the cases, people have to pay the travel on their own and also accommodation. And I had cases where I was just amazed by what people do. Uh, for instance, in Abu Dhabi, I had a volunteer coming from Brisbane in Australia just to wow, participate. Wow, the volunteer. Yeah. And uh, I had people from Canada, from Norway, uh, and from South Africa, all traveling to Abu Dhabi. And wow. yeah, it's, it's really amazing. And then you also, this is at least what I do. I try to give them the best and most interesting roles I can give, given yeah, their of skills, course. of course. Yeah. Because yeah. this is the, the least of a reward that I can give to them. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, I think at the, one of the more recent Super Bowls we were involved with, we had a volunteer that uh, travels the world. Just that's what they do now. Retired and travels the world volunteering at major events. Uh, that's turned cool. Up, that's turned a great up with, idea. Uh, the, the Sydney, Olympics, uh, Sydney Olympics kit on, had the jacket. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Wow, cool. what, a, what a journey this person has been involved with. Uh, is, and, yeah, I, cool. I, can see, I can see why they would in terms of the atmosphere yeah. and vibe the volunteers created as you said these events don't happen without them and i think that i'd almost like to get your input onto it about the the vibe these volunteers right. create is is, is yeah. necessary is literally the, the the vibe of the event as a whole yeah. um they're not just doing the accred badges yes they're doing the operational work but in terms of the feeling of the event which is yeah. rather intangible but it's yeah. it is critical um how have you created that kind of vibe before and excitement from volunteers? Because uh, I guess it's, it's got to come from somewhere, doesn't it? So yeah. how do you um, sure. make that happen and, and make sure people feel confident and happy and, and in a good place to create that? It, it is, um, what I said, it is communication and engaging yeah. with them. Yeah. Sometimes, of course, it's it's a bit problematic if they are really spread out through all, uh, throughout yes. the world. But really, keep them in the loop, uh, keep them updated, send them newsletters, and and yeah. uh, just things like that, so that they feel that they are part of the event, that they are involved, and that we need them. This is also something you sometimes have to get across to your colleagues within the organizing committee. Because they just see them as quote unquote helpers, but they don't yes. see all that background behind. So this is also a crucial part that volunteer managers have to do is make everybody aware of what these people are really doing and how valuable they are. Yes, very good point. And volunteers are, they are a special group of people. Um, I always say in, in, in my training lessons, everybody can volunteer once in their lives. And then they either love it or they hate it. There's nothing in between. Mm, mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Very, very true. Because it's so easy not to come back, isn't it? Yeah. And it's a, it's a healthy virus. Yes. Well, like, uh, once you catch like it, the person you that's don't want any <laughs> vaccine against it. You know, you're happy that you have it. <laughs> yeah, totally. And, and we were speaking before about you've now got this little posse of volunteers that you stay in touch with. A little group that you like to stay. Uh, hopefully, you bump into an event to an event. Exactly. It's great that you you stay in touch with your volunteers. That must be a pretty it's, special it's, part about your job. Not, yeah, because they are not only volunteers. Some of them have become real dear, dear friends of mine. Yeah, and, fantastic. And that's also what um, I love about volunteering and volunteers and being a volunteer manager in the end is all these people you meet from around the world, and there yeah. are always yeah. some who touch your heart and who will have a special place there. And, and you have so much fun together. And of course, you also go through a lot of not so funny things together of that may course. have during events. But once you have gone through it, it's just like, um, how do you call it? Um, it's, it's getting you together. Like it's, you're forming a real team there. Yes, correct. You've been through a lot together. Yeah. Now, this may be a very tricky question for you, but 
Is there, is there a particular moment that stands out to you, uh, uh, an event you've completed or a volunteer that made you smile? Uh, is, there, is there one moment that jumps out to you across your career so far? There, there, there are so many stories. Um, friends told me already I should start writing a book about all these oh, things. That it will be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> not, not really. I mean, the, the Abu Dhabi was always something special. and. Um, also regarding the the event as such with all these athletes in the emirates they are called people of determination like special needs or people with id mm-hmm. and that was a very special event as such um i was uncertain on on how that would work also for me but yeah. i was amazed the very first moment i i met some of the athletes and it's it's just amazing of what they do and that this spark of amazement kind of went over and across the volunteers i think they they yeah. were all just like oh wow i didn't expect that because yeah, amazing. special olympics athletes are really special yeah yeah of course uh, you're in for an incredible ride yeah. coming up for your next role absolutely oh, yeah. so a next question if you will about yeah. success so you've obviously experienced a lot of success yourself is there what does success mean to you in your career or more on a personal level coming home at the end of a day what or you know looking back at christmas on the year that was what does success mean to you and and how do you achieve it that's the, i would say inner satisfaction if that is the right word um, it's not that I'm bragging about it. I'm just more the person who keeps it to herself. Yep. But I I know what I've done, and and um, sometimes I'm a little underestimating of what I did yeah, and what I what achieved. You, yep, for sure. But I myself know what I did, and I'm I'm always happy when the volunteers are happy. Yeah, sure. You I know, that is, that is my main goal and that's <laughs> what I also see as my main task. Yeah, yeah, for sure. If there's nothing and else, I, it's about... If I look people. into a dozen beaming faces um, and, and people come to me and say, hey, this is the best thing I ever did. This is what I want. And, and if I have that, that's all I want. Yes, yeah, for sure. I might um, change tack a little here, and this is one that's just popped up uh, just in talking to you, that you sound like such a passionate person in the way that you deal with volunteers, seeing the, the happy, smiling faces. And uh, it takes a special person um, from our experience to be a volunteer manager like yourself. Um, and I think from what we're seeing across the industry is that you don't sign up to be working in spreadsheets and sending emails and scrolling <laughs> through files and computers. That's not what you signed up in the job to do. I guess across your career, what is the involvement and the point I'm getting to here is about the involvement of software and, and technology in volunteer engagement? Because at the end of the day, black and white, every hour you're not spending in a spreadsheet trying to work out shifts, plans and so on. <laughs> you're being able to spend presenting at a university or, or, or giving someone a high five or making sure a volunteer is appreciated. Could you talk to me a bit about that evolution you've seen and, and maybe the role technology plays? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, that whole system or the, the whole volunteer organization stands and falls, as we say in German, with a good database and software. I mean, without no. it, you may be able, I don't know, maybe to handle a hundred volunteers, which is already a challenge. But when it comes to larger numbers, you cannot do without it, period. So that certainly helps. And the better the software or the system is, the less time you have to spend with the lists and Mm -hmm. and, and do night shifts in the office, which I did in abundance. Yeah. So that is that is really, really crucial. And it, it certainly helps us a lot. I mean, without it, it wouldn't be possible to do that. Yes, of course. Yeah, for sure. And I guess you've seen a lot across your journey from where that was, mm-hmm. well, you, London was probably your biggest games and they would have had systems in place there, but I'm sure you've seen a fair evolution in the way systems are used and technologies used in volunteer programs yeah. since then. Yeah, we definitely. I mean, the... the, the um, systems of course were further developed and it, it's learning by doing also for the for those program developers 
Yes. And um, London, of course, was the biggest one. I mean, we and our team were lucky that we only had to um, handle, I think, about 140 volunteers we had in the, in the venue where we were. But I remember vividly my poor dear colleague from, from Boston who was in charge of rostering all our volunteers and at 2 a.m. in the morning the system just collapsed and she had yeah. to start all over again. I, I, we really didn't envy her. I felt so sorry for, for her. But yeah. um, since oh, then the story. systems have definitely <laughs> improved. So It's a story that unfortunately is <laughs> still happening today out there but uh yeah the, the times are changing and clearly in germany you recognize the efficiencies that can be gained so uh yeah a very very good insight so um now running short on time so i think that that probably wraps up a lot of it is there anything else you wanted to touch on lastly about volunteer engagement or any further advice for people getting into this space not really as i said it's uh, the the golden rules for volunteering or being a volunteer manager always are keep them in the loop don't think they are stupid yes. and appreciate uh what they are doing and what they are investing and giving to us mm -hmm. yeah brilliant yeah i think that that wraps up very nicely well um we, we really do appreciate you taking your time and and look forward to getting this one live. I think everyone's going to really enjoy this and get a lot out of it. So thanks so much and, and we'll make sure that we stay in touch. Yeah, definitely. It was a pleasure, Shannon. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, I really did. Yeah. Thanks so much. We'll speak to you soon. Yeah, okay. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Engage Volunteer Podcast with our good friend Elke, who's joined us all the way from Berlin in Germany. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. If this is your first time listening, then welcome. Our podcast aims to highlight the ways in which organizations and individuals are engaging their communities to connect them to events and causes they're passionate about. The best way to support the Engage Volunteer podcast is to click follow on your Spotify app and tell your friends about us. On the next episode of the Engage Volunteer podcast, we are excited to be joined by Amanda Jenkins, Senior Manager at Fever down here in Australia. During the podcast, Amanda and I chat through what it's like to work for one of the world's most popular sporting bodies and how FIBA manages to connect with their volunteers through Asia Pacific, including how to manage the cultural complexities of a diverse workforce. We look forward to catching you then. Bye.